Hello, you beautiful people. Welcome back to the Long Term Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Villa. Today, we have a neuroscience master's student from the University of Alberta, having recently just completed his undergraduate degree in biochemistry, Giacomo Perry. Welcome. We will discuss medicine and research in undergraduate studies, imposter syndrome, spiritual journey, and staying disciplined in a busy world. Giacomo, everyone, welcome. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Long Term Podcast. We are here with Giacomo Perry. Hello, hello. hello. So, yeah, (laughs) this guy just got accepted to a neuroscience program at the University of Alberta. And that ain't no coincidence. So, so tell me about the journey of uh, just your life and everything you're all about. Uh, sure. So, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Giacomo. Some of my friends call me Gio. Jack. Yeah. I've been called about a million different things in my life. My high school friends used to call me Jam. Giacomo isn't really an easy name, so yeah. I don't really blame them for, for changing it up. Um, I just graduated from the U of A uh, with my degree in biochemistry. Uh, I've been a, a big soccer player my whole life. I've been playing soccer ever since I was five. Um, played through all the levels. Uh, played men's, you name it, I've probably done it with soccer. I've coached a tiny, tiny bit of uh, refing, but nothing much on that end. I, uh, I love to be outside, play any sports, really. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, that's a pretty, pretty basic understanding. I love, love, love music. Music is something that's uh, really important to me. And what's your favorite genre? It's hard to really pick a genre for me, but uh, I think rock music has been something that I've listened to my whole life. My dad's in a band on the side, so uh, he's, uh, he's a big proponent in my life for that. Ever since I was a little kid, I remember listening to rock music, and I uh, still listen to it today. I'm going to give a shameless plug to my dad's band, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sheep Don't Count. Sheep Don't Count. All yeah. right. Hey, are they on Spotify? Uh, they don't make their own music. They're just a okay. cover band. Oh, cool. But uh, they'll have some social media, so if you want to go check that out. Sure. Be... Yeah, give them a shout-out. Give them yeah. a shout-out. Of and course. On, on Instagram? And yeah, on Instagram YouTube. and on Facebook as well. Cool. So, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, what type of research do you do? So, research is like kind of like a broad term, I guess I would say. So, in my undergraduate degree, obviously, there were certain courses I had to take where like it was required, like my first year chemistry courses, my organic chemistry courses, those those all have labs attached to them. So those are required. They basically have a pre-made experiment that you follow, you get results, you write up the lab, and then you submit it kind of thing. And then within the biochemistry program specifically, they had this one full year lab course called Biochemistry 401. And basically what it was, was it was uh, no lectures, it was just lab, two four-hour labs a week from 2 till 6 p.m. on Tuesdays and Thursdays or Mondays and Wednesdays. So that was uh, that was pretty intense. I'm not going to lie, like four hours straight in a lab. Um, and the goal of this course was to simulate what it's like to work in like a real research lab. Uh, it prepares you with a bunch of different techniques, skills, uh, some practices in writing and data analysis, which is really, really helpful for when it comes to your real research or like not just in a course. So I did two research courses that were uh, called directed research projects. So basically I work in like a real funded lab where like they they do academia, they publish papers, things like that. Um, I did a half year research project in my third year and then I just completed a full uh, research project here in my fourth year. Um, My first research project was, uh, so obviously like the deeper you go into science, the more difficult it is to kind of explain these concepts to people who maybe are not um, as well versed in that kind of field. So basically to, to simplify my first research the most, I would say I worked on this protein that is inside of a plant that moves sodium ions, like so salt inside and outside of the plant cell. And my job was to help try to discover the structure of this protein so that someone else in my lab, once we found out the structure, we could then mu- mutate that protein and basically overexpress it and make it really good at moving salt in and out of the cell to basically ultim- or to ultimately make a salt resistant plant so that you can basically grow it in pure salt water and it would still grow fine. Can you translate that in kind of simpler terms for, okay, so you've got it salt and you, mm-hmm. you're trying to adjust the proteins inside to be able to create a plant that's salt resistant. resistant. Yes. So basically mm-hmm. whenever, a, like 
-hmm. a plant will take in water and like other nutrients that usually has salt in it. And as you know, like plants can't grow in salt water or like if you give a plant too much salt water, it'll kill it. Mm -hmm. So basically there's a, there's certain proteins in plant cells that will move salt in and out. And I'm just working on, on one of that. So the, the big overarching kind of thing is that there's over, I think five, uh, it's one or 5 billion hectares of land is salt, like salt intensified, basically that it's very difficult to grow crops on that, in that soil and stuff like that. Oh, okay. So basically in a nutshell, I'm trying to make a salt resistant plant. And if this is successful on a global scale, mm. you could have plants that thrive or plantation that thrives in all these that you said the land, how, how much? How yeah, much like an is? unbelievable amount of land is, mm. is uh, salt infested, you could say. Okay. And so that those salt, salt infested land can't have any plants grown on them. I, I can't actually say for certain that it's no plants, but a lot of the crops that you can grow, like, or that we consume on a daily basis cannot be grown on those, like, on that soil. So Interesting, man. Yeah. And with all the research, all the different facets, different ways, pathways that you could take, even with biochemistry, mm -hmm. right? why did you choose that? Why did I choose biochemistry? Or uh, that research. So... Mm -hmm. I chose that research initially because, so obviously, um, well, I guess not obviously, but mm -hmm. when looking for these directed research projects, you don't enroll in the course. What you have to do is you have to contact a professor that's in the biochemistry faculty and like ask to be put into this directed course. So mm -hmm. basically there's no lecture. You go into the, you go into your lab, they, they give you a minimum of 10 hours a week that you need to spend, but you can spend any time more than that. You can go in whenever you want, whether it be like, one day for five hours and another day for two and then another day for three, or you spend 10 hours a day in the lab, whatever fits your schedule kind of thing. Um, I chose this lab because I thought it would be uh, really, really interesting to kind of, to do some agricultural work. I know it, like we've, we've really been pushing environmental research. I know it's been a big field. So I thought maybe having some, my foot in the door on that could potentially open a, a door going forward in the future on some sort of environmental research because this lab was really the only one inside the faculty of biochemistry that uh, or department of biochemistry that did any environmental style research that's fascinating yeah it's amazing um what was your most memorable moment during your research in undergrad i guess before we cut into that i guess i should go on to what my main research project was for this whole year sure, sure. mostly because i think that is a little more interesting to, mm -hmm. to most people sure so my full year research project this has been a cumulative like I've probably spent at least three or 300 hours in this lab. 300? Yeah, from September till now. So probably a little more than that. Um, and that's just, are you, are you reading most of the time about it? Like doing, uh, finding different ways? Are you, how did, what does that exactly entail? A lot of it is just doing experiments inside the lab and doing data analysis. Trial and error? Yes, for sure. Like it took me three. So this one, I was working on a protein inside the uh cardiac muscle, so inside of your heart. And basically, for a muscle to contract and relax, calcium needs to move in and out of your cells. So when calcium leaves part of your cell, your muscle contracts, and then it has to go back into a membrane, and then it relaxes. So a lot of cardiovascular disease is caused by like a misregulation of calcium moving in and out of your heart. So people who have, like, like I said, any kind of heart disease is usually, yeah, calcium is not moving very well in and out of your heart. And I, my whole research project was working on this protein that moved calcium in and out and seeing what happened to it if, like, you change little things. So, like, oh, does there, would the muscle contract faster if I change this or would the muscle contract slower if I change this? So there's a whole bunch of different kinds of trial and error with that. And how do you isolate for that? Because there's so many things going on. How, mm -hmm. how do you know it's calcium that's doing that? So it's a, it's a very complicated process. And I mean, to even get the protein itself is really hard because it's a protein inside of a membrane. And for people who don't know, membrane proteins are like notoriously difficult to get by yourself versus like other proteins. At the end of the day, when you're doing research, you don't, you're trying to eliminate as many variables as possible. You don't want like, because again, you're just, you have like a little vial of something you, in like, by looking yeah. at it, you have yeah. no idea what's inside it, right? Mm -hmm. So you need to try to remove as many variables as possible, purify this protein as much as possible. Like for, for reference, I probably did like a dozen or so experiments and it took me about three months just to purify the protein, let alone even do a single experiment on actually changing anything. 
Incredible. So it starts from cutting a, a, rab, a rabbit hind leg, mm -hmm. blending it, and then doing like dozens of different kinds of purification to get this little protein. <laughs> That's insane, man. I can't imagine. Here I am just struggling to study for my exams, right? Putting in, oh, it went, should I put in an hour today? Nah, I'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> so like, how did your biochemistry undergraduate studies prepare you for a, because you know you're going into your master's, sure. right? And all this research and all that, how, how, how did it all? Um, for sure. So I think one big thing is I'm very fortunate that I chose biochemistry. I actually took 11 different lab courses uh, throughout my entire degree. 11. Yeah, so I had like two general chemistry, two organic chemistry, two analytical chemistry, like th uh, four biochemistry ones. I had a microbiology one. Um, and yeah, those are some of the names. So I, I got a lot of lab experience, a lot of hands-on work. And then I did two directed research projects, so nine credits worth. And a lot of the skills, so biochemistry is a very broad field and biochemical techniques are used in almost every single laboratory. So the, the nice thing about doing biochemistry, especially if I want to do something more research focused, I, I feel like I already have a leg up on the competition to let's say someone who's done like a general science degree. They haven't done nearly as many lab courses. They're, they usually don't have as much lab experience. So I think getting like just as much lab experience as I could from this degree has really helped me uh, like prepare for it. Like for example, when I had my uh, interview with the, the neuroscience lab, she asked me to like list all the protein purification techniques, all the different types of techniques I've used inside the lab and like see how they compare up to what I'm gonna actually have to be doing going mm -hmm. forward now. Wow, that's fantastic, man. How do you have time for all this? <laughs> like, oh man, later on we'll touch up on, on discipline, but wow, that is, do you, have, do you have any advice for a person like me who struggles with four classes, you know, no labs, you know, and how do you, what do you tell, what do you tell yourself? Because that those classes, I don't know, are you just insanely intelligent? Is that, I, I would not say, I've, I've had to work yeah. pretty hard for it. I, like, mm -hmm. I think, Compared to some people, I have like some natural intelligence, but I think compared to most of the people I compete with now, it's just I have I have to be disciplined because they have that natural. The more you go up, oh, yeah. you, you're surrounded by people just like you. If not, you'll meet people that mm -hmm. are better, right? Yeah. In, in all facets and all yeah. directions that you go to. And do you have any advice uh, for undergraduate students that are interested in pursuing a career in medicine or research? For sure. Um, my biggest advice on that is start early. Uh, that's one thing I regret doing. I didn't start doing like real, real research until my third year. There's plenty of opportunities starting in your first and second year to, uh, to do research. There's, um, there's like courses you could take called like whatever kind of course, like blank 299, I think, where it's like you come in for five hours a week. You basically just, you're volunteering in the lab. You're getting experience. You're learning some new skills. Maybe you're not doing as much hands-on, but you might just be watching, gathering information. And then secondly, summer research. I never did any summer research. Um, it was something that I, I regret not doing. Um, I hate having regrets personally, but like uh, doing summer research can be really helpful for a couple of things. Like one, obviously building some more skills and knowledge. Um, uh, and then secondly, just like, seeing if research is something you'd like. Mm -hmm. Because I, I know a lot of people really dislike doing all their lab courses in university. And to be very fair, like all my general lab courses really weren't that exciting because it's like a pre-made experiment and you have an expected result and it's it's a lot more stressful. Like once you get into the real research side, it's actually a lot more laid back. You know, there's a lot more troubleshooting because you're doing something for the first time that like no one's ever done before, right? So like you might need to like optimize your protocol or like there's a bunch of other things you need to do. So um, start early. I think if, especially if you want to do something like research, and you can find out if you like it or not, too. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I originally thought I wasn't a big fan of research, and then once I got into my directed research labs, I, uh, I fell in love with it. It's, it's been a nice break from school, because uh, it's one of my five courses that I take. Break. Did you say break? Yeah. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> you, okay, so you have, it doesn't feel like work for you. No, it's, it's really nice. Yeah. Um, okay. So, like... I take five courses a term, but the research is technically one of the five courses. So I have like my minimum of 10 hours of research and then four other courses. A lot of people I've talked to that do do research too, that are just like you who are trying to really 
put something on their, on their resume mm -hmm. to build that experience. They tell me that the research is just like another class, if not worse. Yeah. So have you just told yourself over and over that you like this over and over for you to actually like it? Or did you just find a topic that you really liked and now it doesn't feel like work? What is, what is that? What is the secret? I think there's two things to that. Mm -hmm. uh, firstly, like you said, it needs to be something you're interested in. Mm -hmm. Like work will not feel like work if you enjoy it when it comes to anything, whether it be your job, whether it be learning a new skill, whatever. So find a lot, like you need to find a lab that you enjoy doing your research in. Otherwise, it is going to be very dreadful. Like I, I have some friends that are in my biochemistry courses and that I've grown up doing all my biochemistry stuff with. And yeah, they found a lab that maybe they weren't the biggest fan of. And it was a lot more difficult for them to to go in and do their work mm -hmm. for that. Just because like, you, if you don't enjoy it, you're like, oh, I have to like, yeah. oh, I got to go and do yeah. this like three hour experiment. And in your head, you're like, I wish I could be doing something else with those three hours, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then I guess the second thing to that is um, why I kind of like enjoy research and I didn't really gaslight myself into it, but I've, I've always like hated just sitting down and memorizing stuff. And you know, it might be, that might be stupid to say as I picked a degree, that's just <laughs> yeah. a bunch of memorizing yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. um, while I still enjoy it, it's really a breath of fresh air to like stand up, use my, like use my hands for work instead of just sitting there like doing a thousand flashcards. So I, I see it as a break from school because, you know, all my courses are just like memorizing and writing tests. And this is like, I feel like I'm using a completely different part of my brain. It's just refreshing to me. So. Mm -hmm. That is something else, man. I, I, don't know, I just I can't even grasp how much work, 300 hours of just grind time, trial and error. And how do you not lose hope though? Like when, you go through these uh, trials because I've talked about some friends that are in research. They keep trying and then they fail again. They try and they fail. And then during the entire time, like there could be days where it's just nothing, mm -hmm. no progress. What do you tell yourself? Yeah, it's, a, it's definitely a demoralizing thing when experiments don't go right. I think one thing you need to understand when going into research is more often than not, things are going to not work versus work. Mm -hmm. Like things are not going to go right more often than that. So uh, I do have, a, I have an example of it. It is, it is a, a memorable uh, mm -hmm. moment for me okay. where in my first year lab, um, or sorry, not my first year lab, in my first research lab I did, uh, the course is from January to April and like school ends at the end of April and I have a present, I have to present my research to like um, a board basically. At the end I'd have to do a PowerPoint presentation of what I've accomplished. And uh, I remember being about three weeks out to my presentation and I come into the lab and I look and I had, uh, I was growing a bunch of samples on these agar plates. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've ever seen like the mold that can grow on these no, I've plates. Seen, I've seen them. So yeah. like in my case, I should see no mold at all. Like my, there should be no contamination. And I remember three weeks out, I had, I had six plates and I come in and every single one is just covered in mold. And yeah, that's like, in there. Mm -hmm. that's three weeks worth of work completely gone. And my presentation's out in three weeks, so you know, like it is, it is very demoralizing. So you know, you got to make it work. Sometimes you have to put in more hours like that, and 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 in the like the opposite case, there's been some stuff that has just worked on the first try, and you know things go good. So mm -hmm. I think for me, I I kind of overcome those like difficult moments because the wins feel so much bigger than the losses. Like when those experiments actually work and I do get good data, it feels so rewarding for me that like it's okay that things didn't go right the first couple of times, but you know, it can definitely become overwhelming at some points when, you know, Oh, I have a couple of tests coming up and like, I have no time to do this. And yeah, it, it, it does get tough. So I think it's helped me build some sort of resilience just off that, which I can, I can appreciate. And I think that seeps into other aspects in life, right? Just the, being in that trial and error phase, you can apply that with every single facet. Oh, absolutely. Any problem. Right, because mm -hmm. there's gonna be times where it's just everything. You're back in level one yeah. when you were just at level eight. Mm -hmm. And was that the most memorable moment during your research? Or um, was there something else? There, there's a couple different ones. Yeah. So in in my uh, that biochemistry four hundred one class that it basically preps you for your lab. Mm -hmm. It puts you with sixteen other kids mm -hmm. or fifteen other sixteen total uh, in the class. I guess the one thing I should preface about biochemistry is a uh, it's a pretty weird program. So 
at the U of A, they have either a specialization or an honors program, and they accept 225 kids every year. And the average graduating class is about 15. So 15. Yeah. Percent. Like, no, 15 people. Okay, even look. Like, so, like my graduating <laughs> class is 17 kids. Yeah. They had 225 to start. start. And then each year, about half drop out or change. Wow. Why is that? Is it just it's not for them? Is it they try to weed you out? Is this designed? Is it within the structure, the design to weed these people out? So by the end of the second year, there's usually about 50 kids left in biochemistry. So mm-hmm. second year is by far the hardest year. It definitely weeds out a lot of people. I mean, it is a specialized science. Like, it's not just like a general science. So usually the courses are just more difficult and stuff like that. And, you know, if people want to really worry about, like, a lot of people who go into biochemistry want to go into medicine or some sort of research where GPA matters, right? And, you know, picking a, picking something that might be more difficult might make it harder for you to have a, a very strong GPA. So, like, why not? Because medical schools don't care what your undergraduate degree is. You could do a music degree. You could do an arts degree. You could do... A business degree it doesn't matter so like for them if they're going to think they can get a higher gpa somewhere else doing maybe like just a general science then it's probably a smarter idea mm-hmm. um and or they just realize that biochemistry isn't for them <laughs> biochemistry 200 is a notorious course because every science student has to take biochemistry 200 and i would probably say a good like two-thirds of people hate that course mm-hmm. and you know i decided to make that my yeah <laughs> my degree so my you, most memorable moment in that, sorry, I, get, I got sidetracked. Yeah, that's all right. Um, there's a, there, so this was going into my 30 now. So there's only like, I think there's about 50 of us, maybe even a couple less. And this is kind of when I bolstered a lot of my friendships in biochemistry, because like now the group's getting small. We're all kind of in the same classes. We're in more specialized courses. So I met them in this lab. I see them twice a week, eight I've seen hours. seen the group of, the friend group that you're in. There's like four of you. Yeah. Right? Those are the, you're all in biochemistry? Uh, yeah, there's a lot yeah. of us in biochemistry. So uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's been good. But there was one thing we we did a basically a six month protein like purification and then doing experiments. We actually basically blended a beef heart and did a whole bunch of enzyme a stuff. A beef heart. A beef heart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, at the end of the t- I remember at the end of the term or not at the end of the term, but throughout the term, the prof was like, "Oh, you don't need to use this anymore. You could throw it out." And you know, I thought it would. This is gonna sound stupid. I thought it'd be funny to just keep it. So what I would do is I'd always walk around the the lab with like my my, like the pocket of my lab coat yeah. open and people would drop walk by and just yeah. drop the drop their stuff and i probably have a like i have like a large ziploc bag worth mm-hmm. of like vials of the most random things dude that's awesome you've ever heard of that's awesome and i still have it to and this there's day. A story to every single one of them yeah it has yeah. it has like our our names the date like what's inside yeah for all i know it's probably like a biohazard now i, yeah. <laughs> I yeah, don't know. can't open that man my cause that a zombie outbreak yeah no honestly <laughs> like like some of that stuff like has it's been it's been now yeah. some of that stuff has been a year and a half sitting in those okay. tubes so i don't know what's in there I, I keep it inside of my closet and i like to be very honest if i had to like actually dispose of it properly like if i was following proper like women's yeah. stuff i'd actually have to bring it back to the school and put it in the biohazard bin so hey guys if there's a zombie outbreak you know who to blame yeah this guy i, I apologize in advance <laughs> for that uh so i know you wanted to get into medicine right mm-hmm. that's kind of the end goal yeah, so mm-hmm. um, this year I wasn't uh, I wasn't lucky enough to get any interviews, so uh, it's kind of moved forward for that, right? So, you know, I, I had some friends uh, get interviews for medicine this year. Most of them will find out if they uh, get accepted uh, in about second week of May. So they had their interviews a couple weeks ago, and now they're going to find out uh, as, as soon about that. I think for me, medicine is something I still want to pursue. That's my number one priority, even when I discuss with my uh master's professor like she's like oh what's your end goal and you know for me i think being a pediatrician is what i want to do that's, that's like, amazing that's did my you, did you always know you wanted to be a doctor yeah from a very young age i like you can ask my parents my friends my mom especially I told my mom i wanted to be a dentist from when i was five till i was probably about grade seven grade eight mm-hmm. and then i told her you know what uh, I, d- I did a, a lab in grade eight uh, on the eye we dissected like, a, I figure it was a sheep or a horse eye in one of our science classes. We were learning about lenses and stuff. And I fell in love with the eye. So I was like, you know what? I want to be an ophthalmologist. And then uh, I want to do that until about like the end of high school. And then I started volunteering a lot uh, in university. And all of my volunteer stuff was kid, working with kids. So whether it be like coaching, um, doing work at the university, doing physical activity with kids, 
I fell in love with working with kids. For me, it felt really rewarding. It was nice to see like the parents happy. It was nice to see the kids happy. Um, and that's kind of how I found my my drive for pediatrics now. But some sort of medicine has always been on my mind. You're gonna look back one day once you're a doctor. You're gonna it's gonna be all worth it, man. Once you're once you're in it, right? You're yeah. There's always something that you're always mm -hmm. working towards, right? And for sure, we had talked about the imposter syndrome mm -hmm. you know it's very common within students and for high achievers like <laughs> you that that one day you do want to be a pediatrician yeah you do and then you we struggle with this syndrome where for those of you don't, that don't know imposter syndromes where you hit a goal in life and you feel like it's not you right or you go about life and you feel like you don't deserve this opportunity why me right all the yeah. people why me why, why do i deserve to be on this podcast to to be going to the university of alberta to be accepted to this master's program so how do you kind of deal with that in psyche dude yeah it's a it's a, it's a tough one for sure so especially like when choosing a pro competitive program in a, in a graduate degree set like or, or a professional program such as medicine you know like you're going to be surrounded by people wanting to be the best all the time. And it's very difficult. You can get lost in yourself, right? Like, Hey, like I've achieved all these things, but in my mind to even to this day, I still struggle with this. It's like, I don't feel like I'm doing enough or I just don't feel like what I've done has been a good enough accomplishment. Like I, I always, it always needs to be something more. And it, it's a really bad thing that I've, I've built upon myself. And it, it started ever since grade six, honestly, grade six. Yes. And was that because you achieved something that other people didn't necessarily have the ability to? Like you were, because you're a very disciplined person and you've, you're in biochemistry and percentage wise, just you're in the 1%. Let's just, let's just be real. You're, okay. So is that maybe guilt? Is that? I don't know. Like I, it comes to a culmination of things like, to start, the reason why I started in grade six was because of my best friend, Marlo. I don't know if you've actually ever I met do Marlo know Marlo. Before. Yeah, he's a, he's a business guy. Now, yeah, right? he yeah. Was a, yeah, he was the valedictorian in my graduating mm -hmm. year. And probably one of my closest, closest friends growing up ever since kindergarten. Mm -hmm. um, Marlo, if you're listening to this, yeah, uh, I still have yet to beat you in literally <laughs> anything. Um, that guy's just a day. high achiever, eh? Yeah, yeah. and it, it, it started from there. So basically... In grade six is kind of when they started moving away from like excellent, proficient, and basic to like percentages on tests. Yeah. And you know, I always felt like I was quite close academically with Marlo, and I, I challenged myself to to beat Marlo because you know Marlo was the guy to beat. I mean, he ended up being our valedictorian yeah. after all, right? So I remember like in grade six, it started like, oh, I get like ninety two on a test, he would get ninety five. I'd get 97, he'd get 100. And the one that really struck it for me, I don't know if it was somewhere between grade six and grade nine. I got 100 on the test and he got 102.5. He got the bonus question. 100. <laughs> you know, and oh, I didn't get no. the bonus question. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I was really hard on myself for that. Like it was, it was sort of a, a bad, like a, like it's something that's sitting in the back of my head. Like, man, I'm not good enough. Like good enough. I can't beat Marlo. But is it rash? Is it, you know, it's irrational. Absolutely. Right? But, and, but you, do you also, there's a lot of people that are not getting 90s that aren't getting that grades. Mm -hmm. Now, when you tell yourself that, does that actually make sense? Do you absorb that? Or does it just kind of go, oh, they're just, I, how do you rationalize all that? And it, it's hard. And like, I think it's important for me sometimes to take a step back and actually realize what I've accomplished and realize how much I have accomplished and mm -hmm. how proud of myself I should be. I feel like I'm the hardest person on myself. Like, my parents are not like forcing me to do like to become a doctor or anything like this is all on on my end and I, I'm my biggest enemy mm -hmm. you know and uh yeah you're like you said it's it's important to sometimes take a step back and realize like you know what like I actually have accomplished a lot and I should be proud of it mm -hmm. um sometimes it is difficult to see like the way I kind of reverse rationalize it to make it make more sense for me to to have the imposter syndrome is that you know when I'm competing to get into medicine right I'm not competing against the other 99% I'm competing against the other 1%. And, you know, relative to the other 1% that I'm competing against, I'm not that special. And it, it, it's it's really, it's a bad way to think about it, to be very honest. Like, like sure, 
like if you want to say like on paper based on some of the things I accomplished, sure I could be better than X amount of people. But in my opinion, success is not just what you've accomplished on paper. So like I can't even really say that. But you know, when I look at the other people I'm competing against on the applications to medicine, you know, it feels like you know, I've done like 300 hours of research, but, you know, they've done 500 hours or, you know, mm-hmm. I got like a, a whatever GPA and they got like a perfect GPA or, you know, they've done like 800 volunteer hours and I've only done like X amount. So it's, it's really, for me, I always compare myself to those people, but I know it's a, like a really bad habit because like sometimes I feel like I lose my value as a person. It's like, I forget how much I actually have accomplished. Do you find that this could be a factor in why you work so hard though that if you didn't have this you wouldn't work as hard mm-hmm. because you because you are hard on yourself you're telling yourself that's kind of a motivation but can you also work just as hard if you didn't have that see that's the thing with a lot, a lot of people uh, i've heard like the these ultra what's it called super hard working people who just go about life and they own businesses and they they're millionaires and they they have their PhD and they say that the self talk that it, they have it may be toxic but it's helped them reach heights. I mean that's kind of what's worked for them and mm-hmm. it seems to have worked for you. Oh, you, absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think I think the way to go about that is you know it might be cliche but you know surround yourself by people that are better than you. In my mind, like if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. I can partially agree to that, but you know. Like, I've had Marlo as my biggest competition growing up academically my whole life. And, you know, I don't think I would have achieved what I've achieved, what I actually achieved in high school if it weren't for Marlo. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, like, that was the goal I was trying to reach, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, now I set the goal unbelievably high. And I forget about that, right? You know, like, shoot for the moon and you end up among the stars. I I don't know the saying exactly like that. But, you know, like, I still achieved something really, really good. But I get lost because I didn't achieve, like, that super, super crazy goal that I originally did. Are you a perfectionist? Yes. Yeah. And it's, uh, it eats at me sometimes. I can't lie. I think that like, and even now amongst university, like, you know, I'm, I'm one of 15 or 17 that, that graduate and like that, that's an incredible achievement. And I, and I can forget that sometimes, but it's like, I'm with like 15 other people that I call them wizards. Like they're insane. They're incredible. Like what they've accomplished, like all of them have accomplished just as much as me, if not more. And, uh, like if it weren't for them, like if I'm not competing against them in my mind, I don't think I would have gotten to the place I am to today. I think I would actually have become quite complacent uh, with like my academics and what I want to do in my life. Uh, so I'm, I'm thankful that I have chosen to have that competition and like push myself like that. But it definitely becomes unhealthy sometimes when, um, when like I, I struggle mentally, like dealing with not being perfect, right? But as you said. I mean, there's a lot of people just like you, right? And it's, Mm -hmm. I find it so interesting that it's very common in people who have a high drive, like high ambition, just Mm self-motivated. And I just wonder, right, that how much of an impact it does have because as you said it did help you to compare yourself to to marlo Mm -hmm. and to reach those new heights right if you i feel like it's needed in in this in this world but at the same time you need to surround yourself with people to remind you right that hey you are you are loved that hey you are not just your identity isn't just achievement Mm -hmm. right and so can you share a specific moment you felt like an imposter in, in, the, in the journey towards yes. your dreams and ambition? And this, is, this might sound a bit silly of a story, mm-hmm. but for me, this was actually like my biggest eye-opening experience on like, man, imposter syndrome is like actually affecting my mental health. Mm-hmm. And it was, uh, it was in grade 12. Marlo, mm-hmm. you beat me again. <laughs> you know, this was the one, t- this was yeah. the first time in my life that I genuinely thought you know, like good, getting older, Marlo and like I used, I could beat Marlo in a couple tests, but you know, final grade at the very end of the year, I never once beat Marlo in a single subject ever. Mm-hmm. And uh, this was math 30. Uh, mm-hmm. And I had, a, I was, math was my strongest subject. First of all, I'm, like, I'm very fortunate on, on how I've done. I'm very lucky. Um, like just 
how things have gone in my life. I'm very privileged. Uh, and that, I think that's allowed me to also do good in school. That I don't have to ever worry about like financials or like working or any of that stuff. So I think that's also helped me get to where I am today. My parents have worked really hard to help put me in a good position. But uh, yeah, it was math 30. I had a 98 going into the diploma and Marlo had a 99 going into the diploma. So super, super tight. Um, they, uh, that was the craziest I've ever done in a course. Like, I think that was like one course in my mind. I thought I could beat Marlo. So like I tried unbelievably hard, you know, and he was still, he was edging me out by 1%. And, you know, we go into the t- diploma, we write the diploma, and we're sitting in calculus class, like two weeks before COVID hits, actually. And I, I forget, some students said the diploma marks are out. And, like, mm-hmm. a lot of people know that like, me and Marlo were, like, competing against each other. It was kind of like a like, mm-hmm. a like a class thing, like, who's going to beat who? Yeah, no, every, every grade has the two people that are super smart, and sometimes it's three, mm-hmm. and they're just constantly competing. Hey, and then, do you ever get people to ask you what mark you got? After every single test? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, all everybody. And I mean, like, if I look at my year, I don't even think I was, like, if I were to take, take overall average, I probably, I, mm-hmm. I, I think I was probably, like, I think we had, like, 350. If I were to probably guess, I was, like, top 20. I was not, like, number two. Because, like, my English and social were not, like, insane. Like, Marlo was a wizard in every, in every course. <laughs> Fair. But, yeah. We got, we got the diploma marks back. Marlo's like, you go first. And, you know, I, I look at the diploma score. I get 97 on my math diploma. I'm absolutely flabbergasted. I've never gotten a grade that high on a diploma in my life. Mm-hmm. And I was like, holy smokes, like I'm gonna finish the course with um, a 98 or 97, I forget. Mm-hmm. And Marlo checks his diploma mark, you know, everyone's like mm-hmm. antsy. And uh, Marlo scored a 98 on the math diploma. So he beat me by 1% wow. on the math diploma. And so he <laughs> finished with a 98, or sorry, he finished with a 99 and I finished the course with a 98. Oh no, the one. One percent. And the one time I thought I was gonna win. And you know, to like, mm-hmm. oh, you finished with 98. Like, how are you unhappy? And it's because I, I became so absorbed in like the number as my value of a human. Like I literally went home and like, I was, I was like, I sat in my bed for like three hours and I was unbelievably like frustrated. Like I was on the verge of like breaking down. Wow. And that's, that was my eye opening experience. Like, holy smokes, man. Like you just finished math 30 with 98 and you're extremely upset. That's like, that's, that's a insane. problem. Yeah. Uh, what strategies help you alleviate these feelings? I think remembering that like, there, there's a saying that comparison is the thief of joy. And that, that's what it was exactly in that moment. Right. Like I just compared myself to Marlo and I was devastated. Like it, like it took away all the joy of getting my best ever grade in a course and my best ever grade on a diploma. Like how could I, like that's, it was so bad for me. So like, I think it's for me, especially even nowadays, it's, it's good to remember that, well, I think some sort of healthy competition or some competent, some form of competition is healthy in the long run. Like you're not, you know, they, you get in the university almost by, all the time. You're not defined by your grades. And I, and I was letting that happen a lot. So I think now, like, remembering that, you know what, my grades don't define me. Or, you know, that, like, if I do bad on one test or if I'm not as good as these people, that doesn't mean I'm not good at all, you know? And I think people struggling with imposter syndrome really kind of kind of deal with that, where it's like they don't think that they're good at all because they can't be literally perfect. And I've learned that struggling to, or, like, going for perfection is only going to hurt you in the long run. So I try to be be very thankful and take it like take a step back and, and actually see how much I've accomplished in that. That's really like kind of leveled me out and settled me down dealing with that. Yeah. Well, that's great that you found ways to cope and it is a common issue. Yeah. And absolutely. I'm sure everybody you've talked to in, in mm-hmm. university. Oh, even all my friends, they say the same yeah. thing, right? Mm-hmm. They say, Oh, look how much you've accomplished. Like I feel like I've done nothing. And then I'm saying the same thing right back to them. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, it's... I, I feel that with um, academically, I admit I'm not the, gifted nor do I try my best like you seem to be very disciplined but I do um I do put in a lot for running (laughs) yeah I I put in a lot and just I when I run with people I realize just how like with the the average person that doesn't do much running or maybe they do sports here and there but running is not their thing I realize that I'm above average of running and but you're insane yeah (laughs) thank you um but when I show up for the, the the marathon days, the ultra days, I see people <laughs> that are just so conditioned and mm-hmm. their the training training regiments is just clean and their diets just differently and they're older. 
maybe yeah. a decade older, some of them younger, mm -hmm. and it's just different ages. And I feel like I look around and I go, what am I doing? Like I, I yeah. that time I was watching Netflix, that time I was spending time with my friends, was that, I was being lazy. And then I start to kind of twist the paradigm, the narrative in my head, and I go, I'm not enough. I, yeah. I, I didn't do enough, so I'm not enough. And it starts to kind of consolidate internally mm -hmm. and it eats at you. And I, I feel that. And that's just so many people struggle with that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's great to know that, hey, it's not, we're not alone. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like, I think you can generalize it to, like, there's so many things like you said to running or like even to work, right? Work. Like you see your coworker gets a raise yeah. and maybe like, mm -hmm. and you didn't or something like that. Like, are you like, it's really easy for you to think, wow, like I'm lesser than this coworker because I didn't get the raise. There, there, there's so many different ways that, you know, I think like having something to drive you to like be better is good, but not letting it consume you is, mm -hmm. is the big, big thing. I, I, yeah, I'd also add that comparison and imposter syndrome i think they kind of go hand in hand mm -hmm. right because mm -hmm. imposter syndrome you feel like you you're, you shouldn't be this person you're not this person mm -hmm. and comparison just amplifies that yeah because by comparing that person you feel even more guilty for sure and for sure it's a shame and like you said yeah. like you feel like you're not conditioned enough or haven't run yeah. Like, yeah. i started running again because of uh, <laughs> talking to you honestly Bro, we gotta we gotta get a run in one of these days next week morgan absolutely morgan, shout out to morgan early yeah she's hosting it um, like, yeah, I was like, I've been, I've been running again. And, you know, my uncle inspired me last summer. My uncle, uh, like he wasn't happy with like, uh, his, like his body and stuff like that. And he told himself like in one year's time, he was going to run a marathon. Uh, he lives in France actually. And, uh, he comes with my aunt and their daughter every, every summer or wow. every year. Wow. And uh, he came and run the service marathon actually. Oh, cool. And, Dude, you got to sign up, man. Yeah. Good luck. See, see what you do. Are you signed up? No, but I, I want to because it's something I, I'd love to, like, my uncle inspired me to start actually, like, running. So I've been doing some running on and off, but, like, seeing you run and seeing how disciplined <laughs> you're with it, like, holy smokes, man, I feel out of shape, you know? So, bro, sign up today, okay? <laughs> okay. Today, today. We got we to gotta see the deal. We got to make it real. Um, and it'll be the next topic we've got is uh, spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I've seen you at OPH. Yeah. Uh, can you tell me about your spiritual journey? For sure. Uh, and I love that you use the term spiritual journey as well, because uh, I think some people, it's like you, people think you're either like you're religious or you're not, or like, yeah. you know, you're really strong with your faith or you're not. Like it, it's it's not just black and white. It's a, it's, a, it's a scale, right? And, you know, my spiritual journey has had its ups and downs. Like I will admit it hasn't been perfect. I like I first of all, I think I'm far from a perfect Christian. Um, but I guess to kind of preface my my. Uh, spiritual journey. I grew up in a Catholic household, uh, Roman Catholic. All four of my grandparents immigrated from Italy, so yeah. religion was something pretty big for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, I grew up in the Catholic school system. I was an altar server from probably when I was like 10 to 17 or 18. I even I did it saw you at church many times because I used to go at Sunday, Sunday mm -hmm. at, or Saturday, 5 p.m. and then Sunday is like 12. They would throw me to be an altar server whenever, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, mm -hmm. for those who you don't know, the altar server is the little guy that sits beside the priest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, at the church. So I did that my whole life. And then, um, I would say I was quite strong in my faith. It was, it was something that was important to me. It was one of my priorities in life. Uh, COVID hit and you know, like we didn't go, you, like, you can't go into church anymore. Right. So, you know, as a family, we would sit and, uh, watch church online and, you know, like as like kind of, there's just that uncertainty time during COVID, like everything was up in the air, you know, slowly we started like watching church less and less. It, it became less of a priority for our family and, and me as a whole, like, while I still prayed, I just maybe like would only watch the church once a month or something. And then I like probably by 2022, I like completely stopped going to church. Not that I like did not believe in my faith anymore, but I just did not prioritize it as high as I once did. It was something very important to me. And then it became something not a priority anymore. Um, and then uh, I, I about 10 months ago, I got out of a, a year long relationship and that took a big toll on me. And <clears throat> I really turned back to my faith then. Uh, maybe not actually initially after the, the breakup, but I made some poor decisions that I deeply regret doing. Mm -hmm. um, like right after my breakup and I had a, a really big moment where like I, I thought to myself, like, you know, I've strayed extremely far away from my faith. Like this is not who I am. 
-hmm. Like when I had someone tell me like, this is not who you are. Like it really opened my eyes to, you know, I have strayed far from my faith and I'm fortunate that I have surrounded myself with some, some good friends. Uh, Luke, if you're listening to this, I'd like to thank you. I remember uh, sitting on your couch and we sat and prayed for like an hour and a half. And like, I was just like crying the entire time. Like that moment for me was like, it was, it almost felt like a new confirmation, honestly. And I, I got really back into my faith. And now, especially in this past like six months, it's, it's been, I would say even stronger than it was before I kind of strayed away from the church. So I'm, I'm very fortunate how, how that yeah. is now. That's, that's amazing. Uh, I was just at church yesterday mm-hmm. and just the, that feeling of, as you said, you, you've made mistakes. Oh, right? absolutely. You, I'm far from perfect in that. No one is perfect because mm-hmm. we all sin and we're we all, all make mistakes because we're mm-hmm. human. Absolutely. And perfection is just a, an impossible ideal and that people that strive for that are just setting this up, themselves up for failure. And but when I, I was at church and I was just kneeling down and I was just talking about just forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Please, God, forgive me. And I asked God to give me strength and to prepare me for the challenges to come. It feels so liberating right, to Absolutely. know that you're not alone. Mm-hmm. And to know that there is someone out there. I know that we are all made. And that's kind of the premise of the, uh, the this podcast where there is a place for every single person. For sure. Right. Like every single person's yeah. got something. Cause I used to be very judgy. Like just because a person didn't run or didn't work out or didn't prioritize school as much, then they weren't they weren't long term. But now I believe that everyone's got some long term in there. They they can take their lives mm-hmm. and make something out of it. Yeah. Decades and think decades in the in the in the grand scheme of things, there's a place. Yeah. Um but that's great, man. As friends are certainly a great way to it can enhance your faith too because i got my 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 buddy bryce bryce mm-hmm. bone and he we, we go to church all the time he's really busy now with volleyball yeah. and he was the captain for his um, volleyball team in yeah. augustana but just talking to someone about just imperfection just authenticity christ it's so liberating oh absolutely yeah. it's been a it's been a big thing for me now and i think yeah like surrounding yourself is uh with it it makes it it, that much easier right and it's it's like it's nice you know when you're talking with your friends you realize that you know like yeah we are we've all sinned we're all not perfect you know there's things that we struggle with in our faith you know there are some moments where you know you question god for decisions that he's made and you know you think that maybe you had this plan of this how your life was going to turn out and now it's uh it's changed right Mm -hmm. so and i in retrospect i looked at all the problems that i've it was so heavy even last week i had problems where how am I going to get through this? How, mm-hmm. how? And I just kept, I prayed and I prayed to God to give me strength to just keep going, never back down. Now I'm talking to you, I feel liberated because look, and thinking about that time, that was back then, it you know, yeah. even a year ago. Then we, we just keep, we solve every single problem. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. And so can you describe what faith means to you for someone who doesn't practice religion? For sure. And, uh, it's uh, something I actually talk with because, you know, growing up in a Catholic school, mm-hmm. most of my friends were Catholic and we kind of all had our same level of faith. But, you know, moving into university, it's, it's a secular school, right? So, you know, yeah. people from all different religions and all different walks of life are now here. And, you know, uh, they, they talk like some of my biochemistry friends would talk to me about religion all the time. And they'd ask like questions mm-hmm. like, you know, like, how do you, especially in, in the science world, right? Like mm-hmm. these are all like crazy scientists yes it's all everything needs to be Mm evidence-based and they're talking to me like how do you believe in something that like you know you can't you can't see or you can't prove Mm -hmm. and i mean that's the essence of faith as a whole like to have faith is to basically you know fall into the deep end with with no idea of uh how you're going to possibly get out but knowing that there is something there that'll help get you out Mm -hmm. and uh so i think like in a general term, like, yeah, like having faith is, is believing without having to actually have proof. Um, and that it, it is a feeling of comfort to me. You know, it's like, I know that God has a plan for me. I know that, you know, while I might not see things turn out how I originally, I know that in the end, things will turn out. And yeah, it's just, for me, it's a sense of comfort. It's a sense of community and a sense of peace and, and knowing, you know, for me, it's like for times that I feel uncertain, I can always like 
back on the idea that God is certain. He knows. He knows. And even if I might not know, there is someone that knows. There's that safety net mm -hmm. where no matter what happens, because we can overthink it about it, anything. What if oh, I don't sure. get into med school? What mm -hmm. if I don't get a good grade here? What if I get in a car crash? What yeah. if my, my friend dies? What if I die? Mm -hmm. But it's to know that, hey, you get opportunities and you just follow through and trust. That trust and that where you are not solely responsible. Sure, you have to be responsible for your actions and it's mm -hmm. great to, you need to study, you need to work out. But to know that as long as you try your best, there's a plan. Absolutely. And I find that, I feel the same way where yeah. That is so liberating. And in a secular point, uh, in a secular version, there is a higher power, right? And mm -hmm. we were made for a reason. And that yeah. belief, to internalize that belief, and I know I have some friends who don't believe, it, it makes sense to them, sort mm -hmm. of, right? And, and a lot of them, there's different facets towards that too. Absolutely. Right? And I think the hardest mm -hmm. thing for them to wrap around is like, mm -hmm. they need to have some proof yeah. that, that God is real for them to, to fully believe. This is, this is proof right here. I yes. think this is proof right here that chances of us like coming together being civil uh yeah you know just being born in this world and we i feel blessed uh, the the fact that i can talk communication absolutely this is we don't really know like why we do this right mm -hmm. there's no like sure you can look at like the ways like in in your brain there's like the brokest area where mm -hmm. it, it is for speech production yeah. and then vernicke is for but then then there's dopamine right and like dopamine makes you mo motivated to do things, but you don't actually know. Like you just kind of sure sure all these people did their research, but the dig the, the deeper and deeper you get, yeah. the more confused. It's like what what is that? Is it the Dunning Kruger Dunning Kruger effect? Where the more so, you know, yeah. the less you know. Exactly, and that's faith. And no, I I remember having this exact conversation with one of my biochemistry friends. Like she just refused. She's like, I need to have like some sort of evidence, mm -hmm. and I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, like. Just take, in my, I just told him, like, take the human body, for example. Like, think of how unbelievably intricate yeah. we are. You got a cut, man, and how does, how did the blood, the platelets, how did the it's, white blood cells? It's know? insane. And, you yeah. know, like, like you said, you do research and, you know, like, even now, it's like, I've done, like, my research is backed by, like, 20, 30 years of prior research. And, you know, yeah, it's, it's insane. Like, mm -hmm. I'm finding something out that people have never found out before. And then people are going to take what I found and go even deeper and deeper and deeper and realize how little we actually know. Yeah. And how little is actually certain. Mm -hmm. How we can, how much we can say is certain. And, you know, that kind of gives me that, that relief of, you know what? Like, not everything needs to be completely proved, mm -hmm. you know? Being comfortable in where you do not know everything is yes. a great yes. way of going about life. And the moment I realized that, I was liberated from this mm -hmm. just constant compulsion to know everything. Yep. And I, I want to know this. And why, why don't I know that? Why do, like, there's so much information in the world. Mm -hmm. Like, you can't be expected to know everything about even a microphone. Like, how, do you, how does this actually yep. work like? A microphone like how does it absorb sound because you have to look at the frequencies you have to look at just where it's uh coming from like absolutely the, the, the room size yeah. and I don't know, there's just but that's that's a great way of putting yeah. it man for uh, me it's uh snowflakes mm -hmm. is is what Dude, I think snow, of god's yeah, greatest creations you, you know like, like zoom into yeah them. you zoom into a snowflake and you think beautiful holy smokes it's absolutely gorgeous yeah. and like think of how small it is and how intricate yeah something like that is and you know i don't know like for me it's like I don't know how a snowflake, and I mean, sure, we probably found a way of how like a snowflake is made mm -hmm. and all that stuff, but you know, like somebody designed that. Yeah. There's no way that's. You think yeah. that's coincidence? Hell yeah, no. Exactly. Um, in what ways do you integrate your faith into your life, and how has it helped you become the person you are today? Oh, for sure, that's a great question. Actually, um, I think it it works in all aspects of my life. Like it, like my me being religious is not just purely a spiritual thing. I feel like it's a representation of my character. It's a representation of some of my actions. You know, um, like I think whether, like the big three religions kind of preach the same thing of, you know, being humble, serving others, taking care of each other. And I think like me being integrated in my faith has kind of helped me really express those actions and factors like more outwardly than I would say others. Uh, but... <sighs> 
at the end of the day, like, I feel like whatever I do, I kind of, in the back of my head, I have some, like, cognizant thought of, you know, would this be something that is, like, representative of my faith? Would there be, like, <laughs> at the top of my head, I can't think of anything, but there's, there's probably a, a bunch of, the, there's, like, the small decisions on the daily. Day. Interactions, like, this complimenting this person or taking their negativity complement my faith and does it align with my values absolutely that's what it, that's what kind of came to mind when mm -hmm. you had said that yeah for sure so i think like it's not just like what i do with my faith it's like how i am as a whole person like, i think it's it's shaped me like obviously like, my morals and stuff now are based on my faith you know like i make decisions based on my faith um obviously there's sometimes that i i struggle right i i i'll say this yeah I, I guess I'm far from perfect, especially with with all my spiritual journey. There's there's times where like I question why like God said we should do this, or you know like why we follow this idea, or is this really the best decision for me? I don't know, and like I think that kind of ties back into you know being uncertain is okay because you know I'll trust the process that God has written, that God has made, and uh, I go from there. Yeah, and even Jesus, quite when he was on that cross, he questioned why why God he was doubting mm -hmm. and that's he's the the epitome of what it means for self-sacrifice and compassion and love but even then right he still had these very human characteristics yep and we need to accept that you're not perfect and mm -hmm. so balancing academics research and personal life can be pretty challenging <laughs> yeah uh, how do you prioritize and stay disciplined amidst the busy schedule that's a that's a great question, and you know sometimes I ask myself how I even do it sometimes, mm -hmm. and um, discipline is the biggest thing, like you know keeping keeping a busy schedule like that's I mean one thing between like like culture in North America versus even culture in Europe right like here every single minute of our schedule is like filled doing something like we're we're twenty four seven on the clock I think staying organized is a really big thing and finding balance like not getting lost in one of those three big things right like not getting lost in my research not getting lost in my academics and not getting lost in just like working out 24 7 because mm -hmm. i like i i love like i love working out it's something i enjoy doing but like that's like i know i can't spend three hours at the gym every single day it's just something i can't if like you did everything else would suffer yes. if you spent 12 hours every day studying mm -hmm. the gym would suffer your family would suffer yeah, absolutely mm -hmm. so i think finding the biggest thing is finding the balance between the three. And, you know, it, the, the balance does not need to be the exact same all the time. Like, for an example, I'm in final season right now. And the gym is kind of taking a, a back a back seat. You know, it's like I'm not going to the gym at all. But, you know, like I'm probably going to the gym half as much as I'd like. And, you know, the studying time increases. You know, you only have 24 hours in a day, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, the time I allot just changes over time. You know, it's like I got a busy week in research and I know I don't have any big tests coming up. I'm just going to spend more time in the lab. You know, so it's it, the biggest thing is finding the balance and like using your time effectively. Because like, like one thing I'll admit is I'm I'm pretty bad at using my phone and going on social media and like scrolling mm -hmm. through like TikToks or Instagram reels yeah. and like seeing my screen time sometimes at the end of the week is like holy smokes, man! Yeah, <laughs> I get stressed because I didn't have enough time to study or yeah. do this experiment. It's like, well, I probably shouldn't have spent like four hours on my phone. Yeah. So finding the balance is is really big there. And when you say that, how do you go about finding the balance? You said you didn't want to add in um, a specific amount of hours. Like, how do you know whether you're done with that subject or you're you're done with spending time with family or maybe you're done with physical activity? How do you know? Sometimes I actually like a lot, like I literally am going to be at the gym for like, like an hour and a half. And like basically once 90 minutes hits, I'm gone. So sometimes like I feel like I might have not got the maximum I could have got out of my workout or like maybe I didn't complete every single thing I wanted to studying in that session, but like, I know that I can finish it up at another time. Or there's other examples where it's like, I'm going to sit there and finish it until it gets done. Cause like if it's a deadline or like if it's a test, I can't just like not study for it or like not complete it. So in that case, some of the other stuff will kind of take the, the backwards, you know, my usually scheduled gym time might get compressed that week. Or that day because I need to actually extend my studying kind of thing. So I think being okay with sometimes not sticking to an unbelievably rigid schedule is is something like I've had to adapt to. You know, it's like let's say I want to go to the gyms usually like Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. But you know, like, 
oh, I have a big test on, or I have a big test on like a certain day. So that means, you know, the Wednesday gym session gets slowed or like I have a big lab day. So, you know, like I maybe don't spend as much time studying and, you know, you, it, it's balancing that is a big thing. That's fair. And before we started recording, we talked about this idea of motivation and yes. discipline. Can we, can we... Um, in, a, in a crude way possible, I think motivation is kind of just BS. <laughs> uh, I think like motivation can be really impactful in starting you to do something, but it always falls short when it comes to completing something, you know? So, you know, you might be motivated to start running, let's say, right? Yeah. You see, you know, my goal is to run 10K. Yeah, you see a video of some guy just going, you can do it. Yeah. And then you get so fired up within the first couple of days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, you might start running for a week. And then, you know, two weeks later, you're like, man, I don't want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And your motivation is killed. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I know some people that can run off just like recurring motivation where it's like they, they can find the motivation every single time. But I, I applaud those people. I, it, I think it's very difficult to just like constantly stay motivated. So I think discipline far exceeds motivation because at the end of the day like when motivation isn't isn't there you need discipline to help push you through you're not going to be happy all the time it's nope. just unrealistic yeah. I mean, if you if you did you know you're probably on something and later on you'll collapse yeah uh, i was listening to mike tyson and he says that you are nothing without discipline because you, at the slightest bit of pain, mm -hmm. you run away. For sure. And I'm sure you've experienced a great deal of that. Mm -hmm. Whether it become for those late night studying, or it's just when you're pushing yourself in soccer, mm -hmm. whether you're ach achieving these, these daily, weekly goals, yep. right? You're just not going to be inspired. You're not going to be motivated for sure. all of it. Can you take me to your daily or weekly routine? For sure. And uh, like, I'm not someone who actually has a very strict regimen of like what I do for my routine. Really? Yeah. Yeah. That's like, surprising. Yeah. Uh, honestly, it's just, like I said, I, I'm more of an adaptive kind of guy. I keep it. I keep it more variable. There are some things that stay constant. Like I basically have the same breakfast every single morning. That's like I start off my mornings the same. I'll get up. Sometimes what I'll actually do is I'll set my alarm 15 minutes before I want to get up. I'll wake up pissed off and then I'll put I'll, I'll let myself like snooze it for 15 minutes to basically just trick myself to thinking that I actually got more time to sleep mm -hmm. and for, for for the most part it actually works it's your brain yeah <laughs> uh, but it's either oatmeal or a it's oatmeal or a bagel and then a premier protein shake every single morning that's, okay that's that's what I have and then I take the bus to the university every single day so I guess I'll I'll, I'll, I'll restart this so my past four months all my classes were afternoon classes. So from like nine till like one o'clock every single day, I had nothing in my schedule, but that was the time I allowed to kind of go do my research, mm -hmm. uh, work in the lab, X, Y, and Z. So I would get up in the morning, uh, take the bus to school. And basically the commute time from when I leave my house to the second I get on the campus is about an hour. Mm -hmm. So I, I lose two hours every day just on commute. Um, my, my drive there, I actually usually spend time to respond to emails. So I'm sitting on the bus, I'm just on my phone answering emails from whoever. Um, like I'm part of a couple student clubs and like I work at the university and I have other things that I have to deal with. So usually the mornings are when I answer all my emails. Um, then I do my, my lab work in the mornings. I go to my classes. Sometimes I need to go back into the lab after my courses. Sometimes I just go home. Usually on the way home, I use it as a way to decompress for my day. So I usually just sit back, listen to music, take it easy. Because um, I know that when I get back home, I got to grind again so uh and then yeah usually like like later night times like eight o'clock is usually when i try to go to the gym uh on those days and then uh this term i was on two rec sports teams i was on a rec soccer team and a rec mm -hmm. basketball team really yeah i like i filled my schedule to like the minute you're just doing, what, are, what aren't you doing <laughs> you want sports working out uh, going into medicine yeah i don't know i think like I, I, like, I don't think it's that Im impressive as a whole because it just comes down to discipline. Yeah, the sacrifice sleep? No, I sleep seven to eight hours a night. Really? Yeah. You don't, there's no late night studying where you have to... Oh, sure, there's late nights, but on average, like... But you wouldn't sacrifice sleep? No, it. sleep... I, oh, that's a good one. No. That was a problem I actually made in my first couple years of university where, like, I would, like, either, like, pull an all-nighter or, like, get very little sleep. I realized that, you know what? My productivity being extremely sleep deprived 
is really bad. Like for me now, I can write a test better with a little bit less knowledge and not be deprived of my sleep. Because first of all, that's studying when I'm like barely keeping my eyes open. It's not effective studying at all. Like I may be retaining like 10 to 15% of what I need to. Yeah. So yeah, uh, a big thing on I think why like I can stay disciplined is sleep. I'm a big like, I, I'd say eight hours almost every night. Yeah. And, you know, I feel like a lot of university students like don't get that. And I mean, there, there will be points where I don't get eight hours. It's not university students, man. It's a whole world problem. Yeah. 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 Try to get eight out. Try to get at least seven. That's like, for, for me, the bare, bare minimum I ever get is six. Like, anything before, like anything less than that, I will literally just go to bed. Because I won't function. I know that I won't function the next day. No I'll be sitting in a lecture mm-hmm. and I'll like be zoning out the whole time. So, yeah. yeah, sleep's important to that. But like, yeah, I don't like have a, a super strict schedule of like, you know, like I... I me- it's like I, I meditate in the morning or a journal. Like, I don't do any of that stuff. I did before. Um, and then I kind of just, like, weaned away from it. Not that, like, I didn't find it important anymore. But I found that, like, even without it, I was still able to. And I would just sp- be able to spend some more time yeah. doing something else. best for you? Yeah. And, yeah, Stanford uh, University professor, Andrew Huberman, he has this podcast, too, called The Huberman Lab. Yep. He says that sleep is foundation to physical and mental health Mm -hmm. and he's repeated that so many times that i've just fully internalized that where there's days where okay i could spend one more hour studying or one more hour on my phone before bed and i'd sacrifice sleep Mm -hmm. if i did that i run the risk of the next day it being squandered. The workouts won't be as optimal. Mm-hmm. The studying won't be as optimal. Yep. And you won't absorb... Even the relationships, when you interact with people, you are less likely to be able to listen. Yep. And so everything is affected. Mental, physical. Mm-hmm. I'd say even spiritual. Yeah. yeah. Healthy body, healthy yeah. mind. Um, how do you manage stress and prevent mm-hmm. burnout while pursuing your academic and personal goals simultaneously? Which, yeah, that's that's really good as well. Because I, I think, like, mm-hmm. from what I've explained so far, some people, like, who don't know me might think that, like, oh, like, I'm this, like, insane dude who spends robot. 10 hours. Yeah, like, yeah. I remember I'm spending, like, yeah. I get up, I do schoolwork the second I get up, and then I do research, and then I go to the gym, and then I go to bed. Like, that's not sustainable. Like, sure, there are, there are some times that there might be a couple of days or a week that, that goes by where, yeah, I do feel like a robot. Where <laughs> I call it blurs day. Blurs day? Where basically, uh-huh. like, the whole week kind of just blurs into the same day because, like, I'm just, like, I literally feel like I'm a robot rinsing and repeating. And, and that's where the discipline comes in, where I know that this week I need to get that stuff done. But it's really important to find balance. Like, for me, I love playing the guitar. Like, finding time to play guitar is important. Also, like... <laughs> Why don't you to, do, man? <laughs> Why don't you do? I'm not. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm far from spectacular on the guitar. I'm not. I'm not like okay. crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, but like guitar, I I grew up playing video games my whole life. Like, I I remember times in high school where like I didn't come home and play video games for like six hours a night. <laughs> yeah. Like, I yeah. I, I I like religiously played video games for the longest time, and I even did in university until I got to the point where I realized that like I can't just a lot spending that time. I still love playing video games and I find time to play it now. And I think that's like one thing is important for balance. Like I can't just be 24 mm-hmm. seven. Like I'm going to burn out so quick. And that's what I realize is like, if I don't find time to, you know, go out with my friends or like do any of that stuff, it, it can harm you. And you know, that's why I joined those two rec sports teams this term, you know, like Sunday nights was basketball, Wednesday nights was soccer. You know, the other nights I'd find time to go to the gym or like hang out with friends. Like every Every Friday, I had a course with all my biochemistry friends, and then we'd go up to the university bar, like Dewey's, and we'd sit there and we'd we'd yeah. grab a bite and we'd grab a couple of drinks. And, you know, like I think it's important to find balance amongst everything because it's getting like absorbed into one of the things is just not sustainable. I'd say spending time with family and friends is a way to catalyze your productivity mm-hmm. because there are days for me as well when I'm training so hard, studying and. Just this podcast it's a lot of work a oh, lot of work sure. and being able to connect with friends family and just being able to joke around or think about not thinking about about work yes you actually you come back with a peaceful mind and a better mental state and this can actually catapult you to more 
progress. For sure. Yeah. I think one thing that's, uh, that like I've struggled with, I guess, with taking time off is like in the beginning, I always felt really guilty. Taking yeah, time yeah, off. I used to get that. Too. But yeah, that's, exactly. it's a very bad kind of recipe because it's like I'm taking time off, but the entire time I'm taking my break, I'm just thinking about, I'm yeah. wasting my break. And then it basically ends up yeah. being like less productive because now it feel I don't actually feel like refreshed. You come back and you're just high. The cortisol levels are just yes. forcing. So yeah. like I've actually done better in school, like caring less now, like to mm-hmm. actually like physically stepping away from school and like just doing something like I wrote the MCAT last summer and I studied every single day, but Saturdays I didn't lift a finger. Mm-hmm. Like I took the entire day off, spent time with my friends. Like I'd always go out, right. go do something Saturday night during the day, you know, I'd hang out with family, blah, blah, blah. And like, for me, that's, I actually felt refreshed. Mm-hmm. So I think that like, yeah, take breaks when you can and, and don't feel guilty yeah. about taking a break. Yeah. There's a point in my life where I was in, I wasn't in school at the time, but I was in the training work invest. Just, I was just grinding every single hour. I was working construction. And when I wasn't doing that, I was working out when I wasn't doing that, I was doing some sort of self-improvement mm-hmm. thing to augment the mind, body, and soul. And I was like praying constantly. And when I was just watching a movie, I'd be, I'm sure I'd be enjoying myself, but in the back of my head, there's this, I could be making money right now. I could be improving myself. I could be closer to my dreams and ambitions. But the downside onto that is when you're spending time with relationships, you seem anxious, you, you don't, seem like you're you're there and yeah. my, my family my friends they had made the comment that hey relax you're, yeah, so you're relax. Like zoned yeah. out right now man yeah calm down you can tell right you can tell when you're talking to people and you're actually not there yeah and do, do you struggle with n- not being present i think sometimes like especially right now my my friends and friends like when it comes to finals time yeah. i kind of like dissociate a lot <laughs> yeah. i become like so this is the time where, like the discipline really comes in it's like you know what like some of my friends have finished all their exams and, you know, they're going and having fun. And like, I just, I'm just sitting here. Like, I, I know I got to get my stuff done now. And like, yeah, I feel like I do become a little miserable during this time. Or like my friends and family are like, yeah, man, like, like, yeah, we'll like hang out. And I'll, I'll literally see like staring sometimes like into like the wall. Like, yeah. are you good? And are I'm like, yeah. Putting equations in your head, memorizing yeah. flashcards. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I think, <laughs> I mean, even right now, like for example, in two days, I have a 50% final on mm-hmm. neuroscience insane but uh i don't know i think here i the the conversation at least has been like stimulating enough for yeah. for me to, <laughs> to to stay focused you know mm-hmm. um what advice would you give to someone who's putting so much burden onto themselves because they want to get into med school and they, mm-hmm. they're still a bit a little bit far far away and you're you're pretty close to it right you're, you had just got into your um, yeah. master's mm-hmm. program or not even just a person that's struggling with wanting to go into med school but a person that wants to do their master's that wants mm-hmm. to to augment their studying what would, what advice sure. would you give um don't strive for perfection yeah. like straight up I, in the beginning i thought that i could be perfect mm-hmm. and then i realized that i couldn't um secondly like find balance in your life like don't become a hermit that was like one thing that i I, I kind of did in like the first time I bit of the second year was like, I put everything above, like I put school above literally everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I definitely like struggled with some relationships and, and, and things like that. And thirdly, don't worry if you don't get in on your first try. Yeah. Like, you know, a lot of people were like, like, man, don't you feel down that you, like you didn't get in or like you didn't get any interviews. Mm-hmm. And I mean, sure. Like, well, I would have loved to have gotten an interview. Mm-hmm. You know, that doesn't mean like the dream's over, Of course, you know, like, I'm still doing things I want to achieve my goal. And honestly, like that rejection almost like let me take a second to step back and realize how much I actually have accomplished and how proud I should be of myself. And you know, like while some of my friends that I've been competing against might get into medical school on their first try, that doesn't make me any less of a person Mm -hmm. than they are. And I don't know, for me, like I see it as another learning experience. It's more time for me to find who I am, find what I enjoy, um, gather more knowledge, gather more skills and, you know, become prepared. I think a lot of like uh, students that want to pursue medicine, especially have like this mindset of, oh, everything needs to be like literally perfect the whole time. I need to like volunteer in a hospital and I need to do like 800 
like hours doing like school clubs or like any type of 4.0 GPA, like you don't. Obviously, you need to be strong in a lot of different aspects, but they look for more than someone who's just perfect on paper. Mm-hmm. And uh, that'll show in the interview as well. So don't be discouraged if things don't go the way that you originally expected. Mm-hmm. Like I had no idea if I was going to get into medicine on my first try. I mean, me personally, with my imposter mindset, I, I thought there was no shot. And so when I didn't, I was actually like less bothered by it because I just assumed that I wasn't going to. But uh, I don't know. I, honestly, now I actually feel more v- motivated to pursue medicine mm-hmm. now that I've faced some sort of rejection. Because now, like, I almost like, have like a fire under my ass to like, you know what? Mm-hmm. I can do it now. Like, I got close. Mm-hmm. I know it's possible. And just, I just don't know. I just like, for me, it's like I got to stay focused now mm-hmm. and keep going. So I think, you know, like, if you don't have like a perfect 4.0 GPA or like you have a bad test or, you know, things don't go the way that you expect it to, don't be like so hard on yourself. And remember to enjoy your life too, because like when you're in be- when you're between like eighteen and twenty five, like that's supposed to be some of the most fun you have in your life. Like go out, enjoy things, experience things. Like don't get so caught up in this idea of like a goal. Like I think it's important to have that goal, but it's important to like round out your whole life as well. Like you're not just determined by one thing in your life. And I, for me now, it's like, especially in the last like year or two. I have been like going out and doing a lot more things and mm-hmm. I've just, I felt a lot better as a person. And that's also translated into now me even doing better in school because mm-hmm. like I said, going out, getting those breaks, feeling more like myself has made a big difference. That's amazing, man. Yeah. But, yeah. Giacomo Perry, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for um, having me. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, definitely, definitely a great episode and I'm so so happy to have discussed all these things that a lot of not only me but a lot of people will derive great benefit and i gotta <laughs> share these with a lot of people i know a lot of people that are, want to get into medicine don't and give up on your dream there you go <laughs> but as always everyone uh, you're not alone there's a place for you in this world and to keep it long term peace take care hell yeah <laughs>